This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin versus privacy coins. You've heard of these. A lot of people have been asking me questions about them as well. Monero is probably the best well-known one, as well as Zcash. Now, what I'm going to conclude is that privacy at the base layer, at the blockchain level itself, is not a good thing to have. I used to think that it was, but I've really changed my thinking on the, on this. One, one reason that's not the most important reason, but it is important from a growth perspective, is that regulators, Wall Street, banks, custodians who hold cryptocurrencies will never adopt privacy coins. It's just too difficult from a regulatory perspective. An existing system doesn't want to give this sort of privacy to people. Now, the downside to this, in a perfect world, we would have privacy coins and the legacy system would, would accept them. We don't live in a perfect world, so we have to be very practical here. And because you're never going to have these, because regulators will never allow them, it means you're never going to get large flows of money going into privacy coins from institutional investors. It will just get them into too much trouble. And this contrasts sharply with Bitcoin, which has already seen large institutional money flows and will continue to see them. That's the first reason. The second reason is that if you have privacy at the base layer, at the level at level one of the blockchain, it makes it really impossible, as far as I can, as far as I can tell, to audit the base chain, the base chain's money supply, and to look out for inflation bugs. What's an inflation bug? It's just a bug in the code that creates a lot more supply than was intended by the creator of the currency or by the code. And the problem with this is you cannot have a reliable store of value if you can't keep track of the inflation rate, if you cannot keep track of the of the coin's issuance rate or the growth of the coin's money supply. In order to catch these things, you need to be able to audit the base chain. And privacy at the base layer makes this very difficult to do, makes it very difficult to keep track of the coin's money supply. Now, in the history of cryptocurrency, we've had a lot of inflation bugs. These are actually more common than people think. There's a famous one back in 2017 when Stellar, uh, there was a, a 2.2 billion extra uh, XLM that were created. The company ended up having to patch the bug in the code, and then they burned, uh, they burned a corresponding number of XLM. So that's one example. A lot of people may not remember, but Bitcoin itself suffered from an inflation bug very early on where some hacker was able to create uh, 184 billion Bitcoin out of nowhere. Again, the max supply for Bitcoin is 21 million. He was able to hack in and create 184 billion. This was very early on. It's nothing to worry about. Something like this cannot happen again simply because there's so many eyes on the code and it is open source code and people are constantly monitoring the blockchain. They're monitoring the max supply, they're monitoring the circulating supply, and this is why you run a full node so that you can do this. Back in 2010, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was still around. He spotted uh, he spotted this exploit, and he patched the code, and uh, as a result, those 80, 184 billion Bitcoin no longer exist. Uh, that that particular block did not end up being added. Uh, to the blockchain. The other uh, name for this you may have heard of is the value overflow incident. And I will link to this in the description notes below. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I'd encourage you to hit that subscribe and like button and maybe share the video with a few friends as well, especially if you have friends who are interested in cryptocurrency and privacy coins in particular. So the next question would be, is this just my private opinion about privacy coins? Do I just not like them? Well, no, I think it's actually the market's opinion as well. Privacy coins have never been valued that much by the market. It seems like a very good idea, maybe from a libertari libertarian perspective, but in reality, these coins never get valued at too high of a level. So Monero currently has a market cap of 3.9, 4 billion, somewhere around there. And uh, Zcash market cap of 1.3 billion. These very small numbers contrast really sharply with Bitcoin itself, which has a market cap currently, as I'm recording this, of about 651 billion. So privacy coins, if you look at the, by comparing market caps, we can see 
that privacy coins are not really valued by the free market that highly. What the Bitcoin block chain does, what the base layer does, is it is designed to optimize for decentralization. You have blocks that come slow enough, uh, slowly enough that all of the full nodes can verify them and broadcast them. And you also have the blockchain open and transparent and the money supply open and transparent so people can verify it and make sure that no one has gone and created more than 21 million Bitcoin. I think this is the right approach for uh, to Bitcoin. And this is the approach that's been taken for a few years since the fork war, since the block size wars, that the blockchain itself, the base layer, is considered sort of sacro, uh, sacrosanct. And you don't want to have too many programs running on there like you do with Ethereum. You want to keep it very simple, very secure, and very decentralized. If you need things to move more quickly, you can do that on a layer two that's attached to the, uh, the base layer. Also, if you want privacy solutions, they're probably best approached and instituted on layer two. And uh, we see this with the Lightning Network. There's a lot more privacy that's available with the Lightning Network. I'll link to this article so you can check that out. A lot of people mistakenly think that Bitcoin is anonymous. And I would say that it is anonymous to the extent that public addresses where you send and receive Bitcoin, they are anonymous until they get linked to a real world identity. So if you use a Bitcoin address and someone can spot your IP address, or maybe you move your, uh, your Bitcoin from an exchange like Coinbase to a hardware wallet, if you have these sort of transfers, or if you have a website with a donation button, something that looks like this where someone can scan it, this is just an example, but if someone had a public Bitcoin address on their website or on their YouTube channel to collect donations, all of a sudden you know uh, you can link that, that public address to their real world identity, especially if you know who's running the website, what company or what individual, or who's running the YouTube channel. And then you can also if, you, if you've done that, then you can use chain analysis to monitor where the Bitcoin is coming from, where it's going, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no perfect solution to this. You can use coin, jo coin joins, which I don't really recommend at this point, where you can mix up your coins and uh, sort of anonymize them. There are risks to this. People have lost Bitcoin using coin joins. My approach to Bitcoin has not been to use it for some sort of illegal activity or to hide anything using it. Basically, I buy my Bitcoin using Kraken, Coinbase, Gemini, the whole world, all the regulators that is, and the IRS and the US government knows that I'm buying Bitcoin. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about this as well, so it's not exactly a secret. This is all being monitored. If you buy Bitcoin using Coinbase, it's all being sent. All your information is being sent to the IRS. And so I consider Bitcoin as a tool for storing value and for hedging against central bank monetary deflation. It would be great if it were completely private and people couldn't see what was happening. But uh, I think it's more important to be able to, uh, to secure your wealth and store value in Bitcoin. If it was completely private, we wouldn't be able to audit the base layer and make sure that there were still only 21 million uh, Bitcoin. It's important to remember that the Bitcoin blockchain, the base layer, is a record of all transactions that have happened since 2009 when Satoshi mined the Genesis block. If you want to commit a crime, you're better off using US dollars or euros or yen in the form of cash. These do have serial numbers, uh, but to the extent that you can, um, you can use them somewhat anonymously, especially in the black market, this is still the preferred way of committing crimes. Contrary to what people like Christine Lagarde will tell you, they pretend that they don't like Bitcoin because they think it's being used or they pretend it's being used for a lot of black market activity. The real reason they don't use it is because it thwarts the evil plans of central, uh, of central bankers. And the fact that Christine Lagarde herself is a criminal who's been convicted um, when she was the head of the IMF of 
uh, of doing various illegal payouts shows that she's not someone who's really concerned about uh, the illegal uses of money. She's like most central bankers. She just wants control. And she wants one set of rules for you where she can control you and a different set of rules for herself and her elite friends. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.